And now on the line is Professor Dr. Sam McConkey, a professor with the Royal College of Surgeons, and Sam is also a consultant in infectious diseases in Ballmount Hospital. Sam, welcome to the programme. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, Sam, I interviewed you for the first time nearly five years ago after a talk you gave in Trinity College on Ebola. Indeed, the topic of Ebola and the outbreak of it in the DRC and Uganda is the main reason I got in touch with you today to do this second interview. Uh, first of all, bearing in mind that Near FM and Beaumont Hospital are only a kilometre or two away from one another, could you just start off by telling us a bit about, about your job uh, in general in Beaumont Hospital? Okay, so Beaumont is a really big teaching hospital that's linked to the Royal College of Surgeons. We um, have many different specialty units there, and I have been running the one on infectious disease for the last 15 years, since 2005. Infectious disease is very broad, simple things like pneumonia, cellulitis, and urine infections, but also some more serious things like bloodstream infection, which your listeners might recognize as, as sepsis uh, with uh, staphylococci and streptococci and maybe other names of bacteria that people never heard of. Then if people go traveling and come back with fever from other places other than Ireland, we look after them as well. Because we're all near the airport, the, the sick people in the airport tend to be brought here, as you know, and, and that's fine. We, we, we look after the, the people from the airport with unusual things. Mm. If people catch things like tuberculosis or hep C or hep B or HIV, we can also treat that. And the treatments for those are quite good now. Many people think tuberculosis, oh, you know, the, the end is here. But there's actually quite good medicines now for the last um, 1952, really good medicine. Most people with TB now, if you take your tablets for a year, you know, you're basically cured. Okay, and to talk about the main illnesses you come up against every year, like how is the prognosis uh, for the patient, for the people or patients you deal with in Bowman Hospital? The main so so the, gone, they're, a lot, they're a lot better than they used to be. A lot of these things like, you know, syphilis, gonorrhea, tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis C, they've got a very bad reputation. And if anyone hears about them and thinks, oh, I might have it, they're horrified. But I suppose one of the things I'd like the listeners to take away from this is that there's actually very good diagnostic tests and good treatments for these. So if anyone thinks they might have any of those infections... They should either go to the GP or, or another healthcare establishment and actually get tested for, you know, any, any of those um, sort of frightening things. Because if you get the test done, for most part, there's quite good treatment nowadays. I've done several radio interviews about HIV and AIDS and a couple about malaria and TB over the last few years. And, and I'm aware okay. that... I'm aware that we are really fortunate in Ireland that we have the services to treat people infected with these illnesses because a lot of people very good around the world, a lot, of, a lot of people, like for example, I believe that HIV and AIDS uh, could be ended if the funding was available. The biggest problem is, is that true? The funding isn't available. Is that true? There's good funding in fairness in Ireland for HIV yeah, treatment. Yeah, I know, yeah. So if there's a new tablet out now, the government in fairness pay for it for everyone who lives here. But in many countries, particularly in in, in Africa, uh, the, there's a lot of people with HIV there, and they don't have enough money to pay for the tablets. The tablets are expensive. Um, but if you're right, if you tested everyone and everyone took their treatment and everyone stayed on the treatment and took it regularly, these treatments are you have to take them very religiously. You have to take them reliably. If you take them every second day, they don't work properly. So it's very, very important to really um, mm. adhere or comply with the treatment in a, in a regular way. But what I, I tell people, uh, I'll tell you this now, this is my underpants story. So, you know, most people, like when they get up in the morning and put on their underpants, you wouldn't go outside usually without them. So most of us are able to remember to, to put on our underpants. So in the same way, you've got to link in taking your, your tablets to something like your underpants and mm. don't put on your underpants until after you've taken your tablets and then you'll never forget your tablets if you do that. So it's about linking your daily tablets into some already regular activity like dressing in the morning or brushing your teeth or having breakfast or something. And that's particularly important about HIV, is it? Yeah, so our biggest our biggest issue with people is, is actually helping folk to take their tablets. Okay, okay. Okay, to move on to talk a bit about Ebola, as I said at the start of the interview, I interviewed you nearly five years ago. Could you give us a bit of a summary of how the situation in Africa with Ebola has changed from when we did our last interview? 
So what, five years ago, there was a huge outbreak in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, small West African countries that are very poor, don't have good water, don't have much electricity. They're kind of like Ireland 200 years ago before the famine, back in that sort of subsistence farming type of life. And that outbreak maybe killed 20,000 20, people. Eventually, with a lot of help from people in Sierra Leone and Liberia and other countries, eventually it was controlled and it stopped now. Unfortunately, then there was another small outbreak in, in Congo uh, about four years ago. And then about a year ago, it was an outbreak of what's become a very large outbreak in uh, the rural part of the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC, as you've called it. it. used to be known as Zaire. It's a very big country in the heart of Africa. Um, in fact, I don't know if you, mm. then your listeners like films. I don't know that there's... Heart of Darkness, which is, um, oh. uh, Joseph Conrad, the film and book are, are set there, and there's several other movies set there. And, you know, it, it was a of all the colonial uh, exploitations in Africa, this is possibly the worst. There was the King of Belgium called Prince Leopold. He owned it as his own personal colony, and he exploited it for rubber plantations and did horrendous things. I have to say, in in the name of profit. So it's it's been a, a sad. And, and very difficult history, you know, for a couple of hundred years. Uh, an Irish fellow called Stanley Parks, uh, you know, traveled there and uh, met Livingstone. And, and uh, Parks is the, uh, you know, if you look at the statue beside the dead zoo up on, on Marion, Marion Street, Marion Road, in front of the doll, his, his statue's up there. So, you know, there have been Irish people out there traveling around in the past as well. But unfortunately, there, about a year ago, they started Ebola, and it really has gone rampant and spreading now widely through through DRC. Well, I've done a couple of radio interviews about the conflict in DRC, and what's going on over there is unbelievable. Uh, the, just the whole con- the, the military conflict, you know. One thing I remember from our interview in 2014 is that you said that while at that time there was no vaccination for Ebola, you said that it was likely that, that there would that there would be one found or created and i think that's actually happened hasn't it so that's br- I be- yeah that's brilliant news isn't it there, there are there are two preventive vaccinations it doesn't really help you if you've already got it but okay. they, they are they're delivering it to people in that area and to healthcare workers okay. uh, to try and prevent preventable so i do think vaccines in general uh, can really help us prevent diseases and um, that's true for many cancers you can actually prevent many cancers with vaccines like Hepatitis B vaccine prevents hepatocellular carcinoma, and as I'm sure you and your listeners know, human papillomavirus vaccine prevents cervical carcinoma. Uh, and in women, uh, all this talk about smear tests, in my view, it should be all about vaccines. If everyone was vaccinated, then we'd have a lot less cervical cancer to start with. So we need to be promoting vaccines in both men and women. Uh, men, the cervical uh, or the human papillomavirus causes uh, head and mouth cancer and penile and anal cancer. So I, I, I do think men should, boys should be getting it as well as girls. It's not just an issue for women's health. It's an issue for men's health as well. Okay, and I understand that uh, only in the last few days, I believe, the Ebola outbreak has spread somewhat to Uganda. What, in your opinion, is the mo- most likely way in which the situation is going to develop? Um, well, it's people. people are traveling from one place to another, and it's human travel that's um, causing the Ebola to spread. So we really need um, control of this outbreak with better diagnostics and better um, control and essentially sort of quarantine and, and careful monitoring of contacts. So if I'm diagnosed with Ebola today, everyone who I've touched or met in the last 10, 20 days should be uh, watched carefully for several weeks to see if they're okay. And maybe even their movements need to be restricted. And... The, the the frontline health workers dealing with the Ebola outbreak are really doing are really brilliant heroes, aren't they? Really amazing. Sadly, you know, in in Sierra Leone, some of them died. Some of them I knew. Uh, so it oh. is it is a risk to staff. Now we wear we wear gloves and gowns and aprons and all the hazmat suits. But even despite all that, there were some people who actually ended up catching Ebola. Well, no, I think that that's a, a good for everyone to realise that the world is a very small place. And what's happening on the other side, whether it's in Africa or Asia, you know, affects all of us. So we can't just sort of think that we in Ireland or in North Dublin are, are an island all on our own. 
we're actually we've a lot of people coming and going and traveling and we like traveling so so the world is one world if you like in my view and and we're all part of one one world together so really we've got to care for and look after people in other parts of the world who, who have different diseases as well rather than just looking at our own little patch because we're interconnected